Even though I had always loved photography, I, I never had any formal training. And what I was doing was I was taking in tremendously disturbing things or yeah. traumatic things through yeah. the lens, and I was actually taking them into myself. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that really, really, really affected me. A not so distant rumble of traffic. I uh, dropped off my eldest into school. He's uh, practicing his part in the, uh, the end of term play. It's a drama competition. One about dementia. It's not exactly very festive, if I'm going to be honest with you. There's one about dementia. There's one about a, a vehicle accident or something. But uh, yeah, so we, we got out early, myself and Barnes, to bark a lot for our photo walk. Sun is just coming up. Bit of a blue sky. <laughs> it's a faint hint, actually. Some sort of purple sky, which I think promises maybe a bit of better weather. It's, uh, it's Thatcham's version of, uh, of the Northern Lights. Anyway, 412 episodes in today. Here we are together, making our photo walk, a show where we walk and make pictures, photographically sketchbooking our time together each week, enjoying the letters and inspirational stories you've sent in and listening back to special studio conversations with guests from around the world. And this week, my guest is Rochelle Steele, um, who, since the moment I was introduced to her work, has absolutely fascinated me. Her website is, um, well, it's a wash with super collections, as she terms them. Uh, that's her name for, for projects as such, which is a concept I quite like, actually, collections. Uh, Rochelle has been wowing audiences in a plethora of international places with her work, such as Rome, the Bowers Museum in California, uh, New York City's uh, Times Square. This way, pups, come on, going the wrong way. Uh, and also uh, John Wayne, John Wayne Airport. My dad loved John Wayne. Oh, he was... Um, I know these days the narrative is, is dated, but um, my dad, oh, it's decades ago now, Sunday afternoons, John Wayne movie or a spaghetti western. Seventh heaven for my dad, John Wayne, John Wayne Airport, eh? I'd forgotten that existed. Get off your Airbus and drink your milk. Not a very good impression of our Mr. Wayne, I appreciate. And actually, not a line he said. That, get off your horse and drink your milk, is a bit like uh, beam me up Scotty. Famous phrases from movies that were never said. True, look it up. Uh, anyway. Uh, Rochelle has, a, has an interesting background. She was, uh, for nine years, she was in the, the, the um, US Navy, which uh, yields a, a fair amount of questions toward the start, actually, uh, because uh, her time there, the PTSD that she suffered because of some missions that she went on, um, it all sort of plays a part in her photographic story with something more personal as well to, to add. Anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, I spend a lot of time researching my guests, but, uh, <laughs> but unless I'm doing that thing my wife calls man-looking, which is very possible, there's, uh, there's much photographic work within the website, but not a lot of words. So if a picture really does paint a thousand of them, words that is, I'm going to enjoy, with Rochelle's help, unpicking the stories within the collection she presents, minus huge amounts of, <laughs> of reference text. So I think it's going to be fun doing that when you consider the collection titles. Get these. Scent of Morocco. Early morning incense. Shark skin boots. Decades of love. Confinement. Blindside. Captured framed in California. Today on the photo walk. And as I was pulling into the base and I saw the ships and I knew I was going to have to park my car, find my ship, which one was even mine. The sense of dread and fear and excitement. There's something about in other parts of the world that I, I really wish people would try to embody more. This spirit of I literally have nothing. 
but do you want half? I had come to a point in my life where I realized there was a lot of secrets and I'd, I'd known people for 10 years and they didn't know anything about my childhood. I'm an obsessed, I'm an obsessed photography maniac is where my headspace is. <laughs> and I just thought it wasn't like that. Oh, I don't want to shoot. It wasn't that. It was just gone from me. And in 2010, someone gifted me a camera, Canon Rebel, and said, hey, start shooting again. That's Rochelle Steele, who joins me in a while on the show today, along with the letters you've been sending in. And before I give you a flavour of today's mailbag, thank you to our Extra Milers and MPB.com who sponsor this show and keep us here week on week. MPB.com, they're a website uh, where you can safely buy, sell, and trade quality used photo and video gear online and be a part of this circular economy that's becoming ever more important. If you're buying, you get peace of mind because there's a six-month guarantee on the kit. And if you're trading or selling, MPB will send a courier to pick up your kit on the day you specify. And once it's arrived back at their warehouse and it's gone through the checks to make sure it's all being graded properly, you get paid direct into your account quickly. MPB.com. It's a very easy-to-use website and it's helping photographers to buy quality-use kit or sell gear that we no longer need so we can free up some cash, give others a chance to make their stories and perhaps invest in some, some new quality-use gear for ourselves. On the show today, then, this is a bit random, but the Tooth Fairy is coming to get me, all because of my mother-in-law's ginger biscuit advent gift all will be explained. Beware those who live in Austria, because it's not the Tooth Fairy you want to worry about. We've got some pictures and a story about the fearsome demon that's patrolling the Christmas markets, threatening to take those on the naughty list off in a sack. What, Neil? Have you been at the eggnog already at this time of the morning? It's all true. Listen on. Pictures and memories. The ancient monuments. And uh, no, my other listener, that's not a nod back to my very lovely mother-in-law. I saw your eyebrows rising. Although we do have a nod to a wonderful wildlife photographer in Canada. Now, it's the third Friday in the month, so usually it's a little bit of jangling with uh, our friend Mally. Though I thought this week would make an appropriate week for Valerie Jardin with her visual stories. This month we are talking about eye contact, amongst other things, in portraits and candids. Right, shall we walk? Checklist out. Coffee, check. Walking boots, check. Warm walking pants, check. Those temperatures are diving again here. And um, Christmas ginger biscuits for a snack. Oh, Neil... Let me hold on that one till you've told us the story of the ginger biscuits. All right, let's walk. The uh, the perimeter fence of what used to be this United States Air Force uh, base, Greenham Common, now uh, returned to common land. Cattle grazing, which uh, reminds me, keep, keep a look out for them. Barney um, is quite intrigued by the cows and the bullocks, the cattle that we have here. I'm not quite sure they'd be so f fun to to play with him. So uh, that is one thing you keep your eye out for when you're up here. Horses, horses too. But the, the perimeter, I mean, once upon a time, this airbase had the longest runway in Europe. I believe, and I have talked about this on the podcast before, so I'm not entirely sure I've got this right. I believe, you will write to me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, it was once one of the emergency runways designated for uh, the space shuttle to land at if it went off course or things went awry. So the walk around it, um, the traffic is quite close by, which is a slight annoyance, but uh, the walk around it is a really good lengthy walk. You can do, I think around the whole perimeter, something like, is it five or six miles? I know the length of the runway is much less than that, but once you go round the perimeter, go through the woodland, there's quite a lot of woodland to, to visit as we've walked through before you and I together. We should make a sketchbook picture to start the day. It is uh, dank. It's darkish. The light hasn't really peeped properly yet. There's a solitary chair here. I like taking photographs of solitary chairs. I think I could... In Rochelle's terms, probably have um, have a collection. 
There's a fenced area there as well. There's a thing about this uh, airbase, uh, the vastness of it, that occasionally you come across areas that uh, have things like uh, fire hydrants sticking out of a bush or just the ground, um, sharing space with the trees and the bushes, all the thistles and everything that's uh, taking over this land. Right, um, I need to go back a bit, step back a bit. This way, pups, come on, otherwise you're going to be in shot. Uh, F4, actually I quite like this, almost a silhouette. F4, 1 2 5th, 640 ISO. There we go. Sketchbook to, uh, to start the walk. Um, <laughs> This, uh, this public announcement of pain you're about to hear does actually lead into photography, by the way. Uh, shoehorn slightly, granted, but uh, while you're here, just have a look at my tooth, would you? Look, there. That's there. No, no, further back. There, there you go. That one. Top left. Yeah. It's not right, you know. And right before Christmas, too. I, uh, I saw the dentist on Monday, and Emily, my wonderfully patient dentist, says it's fine, and sent me away with some Sensodyne toothpaste. Other toothpastes are available. Um, but she's, she's usually spot on, is Emily, so I am trusting her, but it doesn't feel right. Definitely. She gave me, <laughs> she gave me three bits of advice as I, as I parted on, uh, on Monday from, the, uh, from the, the surgery. Three bits of advice. Brush twice a day with Sensodyne. Other toothpaste are available. A floss at least once a day. And stay away from the mother-in-law's baking. She is the dark queen of sweet treats in our life. I swear she's working in tandem with a sweet fairy or the tooth fairy. It's an unlikely duo. Um, the, the tooth fairy arrives in a silent flutter and cloud of, I don't know, fairy dust. And, uh, and swaps a tooth kept under the pillow with a shiny coin. A dollar, a euro, a pound coin, two quid, if you're lucky. Or if you're very lucky and you're a footballer's kid, the keys to a brand new Maserati. Uh, meanwhile, my mum-in-law, well, <laughs> she's setting up tooth fairy appointments by arriving with a pair of euphemistic pliers. Taking your teeth out at any stage of the day in the form of benign-looking advent gingerbreads, yes. There are 24 of these gingerbreads to munch through during the month. We get a tin each in our house, which of themselves are very nice. Although it's 1,200 extra calories across the 24 days. That's not the problem per se. It's the, the razor sharp icing on the biscuits with peaks that are like diamond cutters. And I was just polishing off number seven with a couple last Thursday. Um, after the recording, and one of these peaks, honestly, it, um, well, it like, <laughs> it speared my tooth, or a filling. I heard the noise, it was a sort of desperate crunching, and a sudden pain to the side of my face. It was like being a Turkish referee, so it was, if you're up on your sports news. If you've, if you've ever read James Frey's A Million Little Pieces and survived the dentist scene, with uh, the description of that sort of white noise pain. Um, well, that's what it was like. <laughs> Not one to exaggerate, clearly. It's, it's smarting this morning in the, in the cold air of this walk. It's like, oh, don't do that again. Anyway, suffice to say, I'm keeping a wary eye on my mother-in-law. I love it a bit. But as far as my tooth, it is quite literally, it feels like it's in bits anyway. I did say this had photographic connections, loosely, tenuously. Um, so Sir Morrisa Webster has written in with this Christmas offering, which isn't exactly very festive. I'll put the two pictures he sent in, though, on the show page today. Oh, beautifully dark and ominous, so they are. Hi, Neil. I trust you and yours are keeping well and the family are looking forward to the festive season. Well, Morris, I was, till the tooth thing. Family Webster recently travelled to the beautiful city of Salzburg to enjoy the Christmas markets, stunning scenery and great food. 
I can see you steer clear of the gingerbread. Uh, with three photographers in our family, many shots were taken, albeit slightly different to our usual approach to uh, street and documentary photography. Because we were conscious of the strict Austrian privacy laws, as outlined by your guest Alex Frederiksen in earlier episodes, we did our best not to identify subjects in case you need the gaps filling here. Uh, Austria has uh, some fairly strict, well, very strict privacy laws, particularly if it comes to pastimes like street photography, professions like street photography. You're not supposed to identify anybody in a picture, which is why we talk much of intentional camera movement pictures and photographs of um, oh, people's backs, trying to tell the story of Austria without telling the story too closely of its people. That said, inevitably, natural photographic instincts did occasionally take over, but I'm pleased to report there were no issues. I'm sure the, the Christmas markets, Morris, surely people, uh, I'm sure that people would expect that to be documented. I mean, in one of your photographs, in particular, one of them, there's, uh, there are other people photographing, unless you're about to say, that was my family, Neil. Um, I, I did have a moment's hesitation before taking candidates of the locals that I've attached or sent to you, but pressed the shutter anyway, thinking, what's the worst that can happen? Oh, I don't know, Morris. Three nights in jail and all the gingerbreads my mother-in-law can inflict upon you? I don't know. Wishing you and yours all the best. Couple of photos uh, from Morris. Now... I will just say, you can see the complete collection, which is fantastic, by following the link I'll put on the show page. But these two you sent in seem very, <laughs> very apposite. Uh, and here's the connection, loosely, tenuously. The beast of Biscuitland is clearly alive and well and living in Salzburg, it would seem. Look at this figure in your picture. There's a, uh, as I say, there's a dark foreboding mood to these two photographs in particular because there's a devil in them a literal in black and white makes it even more moody devil or devil character or characters because usually at these christmas markets <laughs> it's all woolly hats mulled wine and the occasional santa's grotto but not it would seem in austria certainly not in salzburg look at this figure in the picture honestly this 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 is Krampus, uh, a central European folklore legend. He is the devilish companion of St. Nicholas, although he's a half goat, half demon monster who punishes misbehaving children at Christmas time. He sounds absolutely lovely <laughs> in no way, shape or form. I did look this up because here is this character walking around the Christmas market at Salzburg. People take pleasure in, <laughs> in dressing up as this beast. You know, it's, it's a... It's a privilege to be asked to step in as a body double for Santa Claus. Maybe a bit of a, a mixed uh, privilege when you think, do you think I look like Santa then? Is it the grey beard and the slightly portly features? But uh, dressing as one of these things, I don't know, is there privilege in that? But I looked it up because I couldn't believe this was in any way, shape or form a companion of St Nick. But you're right, like my mum-in-law and, uh, and the Tooth Fairy, this is a very strange pairing indeed. This creature, this one called Krampus and St Nicholas, are said to arrive on the evening of December 5th, which is Krampus night, while St Nicholas rewards nice children by leaving presents. Krampus beats those who are naughty with branches and sticks. In some cases, he's said to eat them and take them to hell. More recently, Concerns have been expressed in Austria about whether the tradition is appropriate for children. You don't say. It's okay that you can parade a demon character that beats children with sticks and puts them in a sack and takes them down to hell to devour them, but uh, don't you dare think about making historical street pictures where people just may appear in them. No. No. <laughs> no, thou, thou shalt not, anyway. I'm back in Austria in April with any luck, so I'll not say more, but these are fantastic pictures. Thank you for the photographs from your walk. And we've sort of started with a, well, a, a kind of festive one. <laughs> festive to a degree, if you like demon creatures in Salzburg at Christmas markets. The light's starting to uh, to show now. 
peeping. Barney's staying very close to me. He gets a bit nervous when there's uh, packs of dogs. And there's a couple of beautiful red setters over there. Red setters, though, can be quite, uh, can be quite boisterous. He's keeping his distance, so he is. But I love these, um, these yellow plants that are many on, this, uh, on this, this particular part of the land at Greenham Common. Sorry, I'm trying to get my I'm a bit fingers and fingers all over the place. F4, 1, 2, 5, 800 ISO. Simple title, Yellow Flowers. Anyway, today, two guests for you. Rochelle Steele in a moment. And then, uh, well, we moved in, 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 in terms of weeks, Valerie Jardin's visual stories. That's to come later on during the show. I thought it sort of matched this week, probably more than last. So Valerie is, uh, Valerie is on today. So stories to tell, people to meet. I'll do a quick wish you were here from Don Ridgway, without the E, <laughs> anywhere in his name. Don from San Diego, which does have an E. Uh, <laughs> so for Don, I'm replacing it, sir, with an A and a Y. San Diego. Greetings from San Diego, Neil. Don wants to get four things off his chest. One, you, oh dear, I think I'm in trouble. You and all England insist on spelling my name incorrectly, but otherwise, the Ridgeway episode, ah, oh, yes. The Ridgeway episode, that was a very cold day. A very dank, bleu sky on that day as well. Was, um, was very nice, says Don. Oh, thank you. When we walked along the Ridgeway, with an E in its title, even though your surname doesn't have one, the Ridgeway in England does, it was, uh, well, I really enjoyed it. We must return there. There's a lot of it. It's... Uh, well, it's, it's Britain's oldest road. As I said on the show, though, many people claim this kind of thing, particularly pubs. Every town you go to, certainly in England, there's a pub in the town or the village that claims to be the oldest one in the land. This is the oldest pub. It is, yes. Is it? Oh, the last village I was in, they said they had the oldest pub and the one before that. Anyway, apologies, Don, <laughs> for, the, for the incorrect name spelling. But in England land... We do use the E. You may not, we do. Uh, number two, I love Craig Mod's video of the master pizza toast crafter. And I've loved his book, Kisa Kisa. I'm American, so the comma goes with, <laughs> within the quotation marks. I feel like I'm in trouble here, Don, I really do. It's like an English lesson. But yes, that particular episode talking to Craig Mod, I'll link to that in the show notes today. Uh, the American who lives in Japan and has this, well, wonderful life walking across Japan writing for his newsletters, photographing, making these exquisite, beautiful books, and Kisa Kisa, which is the story of Kisa Ten, which are the coffee and uh, tea houses that you find along the, along the beaten path in, uh, in Japan, are wonderful, thousands of them, and some of them, of course, are uh, just in people's front rooms. It's a lovely culture, it really is. Three, I have a vague memory getting old enough that they're all pretty vague, says Don, not me, of having signed up for some level of support for your photo walk, but I can't remember what it was. If you could tell me, I might be able to nudge it up a level. See, <laughs> see, now we're making friends again, I think. Although, Don, I did check in the Extra Mile group, and you're not there. So nudging up would be <laughs> going from nothing to something. Uh, or, Don, or, or you could buy my book. Your book, Neil, yes, it is now out. And at some stage today, when it fits in properly, I'll record a little studio self thing uh, where I tell you all about the book. Now, four, says Don. Oh, you've mentioned Avebury more than once, including its place at one end of the, the ridge with E way. And I think I, I would call this picture that I've sent you, which you'll find on the show page today next to Don's correctly spelt name I think I should call it well not wish you were here but I wish I were there we were there you see in 2014 at Avebury in England and it was quite special as was last spring's visit to the Ring of Brodger I mean they're magical aren't they the way these stones got there I know there's a there's well whole films television programs podcasts on on how things like Stonehenge Avebury Stone Circle and the, uh, the giant pyramids were built, but it still amazes me. 
And there's, there's still a part of me that likes to just think, or thinks it would be easier to believe, aliens came down and popped them up one day. But uh, the ones at Avebury are actually, well, perhaps, 800 years older than Stonehenge, which must be driving the Hengers mad, because there's much rivalry between the two. And one of the, uh, one of the stones uh, I took a sketchbook image of, uh, it's in my ebook, so it is Don. So there we go. <laughs> you and your family, Don, you could buy the book, then you're nudging up your support. The Ring of Brogga, though, well, you've beaten me to that. It's in the Orkneys in Scotland. 36 stones remain of the original 60, 13 burial grounds. Uh, this, too, is older than Stonehenge and, and the Great Pyramids of Egypt, which is bragging rights secured. The Scottish geologist Hugh Miller, visiting them in 1846, clearly I looked this bit up, wrote that the stones looked like an assemblage of ancient druids, mysteriously stern and invisibly silent and shaggy. <laughs> yes, he really did write shaggy. Anyway, Don had a PS on the subject of, of why. This way, pups, come on. Um, which Don is the title of my new ebook? Did I mention that just a moment ago? Uh, your family, I know they'd love it and it would nudge up your support. Did I mention that a moment ago? Anyway, Don had a PS. Um, my favourite why, says Don, is one of Gary Winogrand's wonderful aphorisms, which is a, a pithy observation containing a general truth. Don, this has been like history in a language lesson, all in one. And uh, I'm looking forward to far more letters from you in 2024, if this is, <laughs> if, if this is the quality of, of them to expect. Anyway, Don Ridgway, minus his E, what did Gary Winogrand also without an E say, or aphorise? I photograph to see what things will look like if I photograph them. <laughs> I like that a lot. And it's a fitting place to have a conversation about making pictures and introduce the stage a photographer called Rachel Steele, who after nine years in the US Navy returned to her original love of black and white photography. If, like me, you are partial to the beauty of black and white, this will be a treat today. And actually, it plays very well into my conversation later on with, with Valerie, because she too has a love for the medium of black and white photography. Although, funnily enough, one of Rochelle's projects, I, or collections, I most love is actually a colour one, a love letter to age in many ways, which we'll talk about later on. Anyway, who said photography should have rules, huh? Here's Rochelle Steele, part one of two parts on the show today. Nine years, Rochelle, in the US Navy as an electronics technician. Now, I know what electronics are, and I know broadly what a technician does, but the two combined, in what way as, as a job for you within the Navy? Specifically, as far as the electronics were concerned, I mostly worked on communication systems. So ship to satellite, ship to submarine um, was, was mostly what my focus was. Some top secret stuff I can't go into. <laughs> um, and, and just generally, I guess when you're on a ship, if something breaks, you fix it, whether you're yeah. trained to or not. And so just kind of, I consider myself a troubleshooter of sorts, a jack of all trades. <laughs> I've never wanted to work on one of those desks where people only ever phone you when there's a problem. And in a much more severe fashion in that you're aboard a, a ship at sea, you know, w with the Navy. It's not like, look, my, my internet's not working. It's probably something far more serious when they call you, isn't it? Uh, it, was, it was much more intense. And I often describe it as, you know, something you have to attend to immediately. Yeah. But it could be a thousand different things. Yeah. And just, I think, controlling, learning how to control your brain. <laughs> under crisis and you know falling back on your skill okay well where do we start and how do we cut it in half and how do we cut that in half and eventually yeah. whoo crisis is over we you know we dodged the bullet on that one I, I would imagine that 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 ability those things that you've learned have set you up for a very uh for a much stronger career in photography because photography is a lot about um problem solving isn't it and sometimes sometimes it's technical other times it's creative other times it's dealing with people people skills would have been such an important part of your role, wouldn't they? Yeah, I, I think one of the most critical things to master is how to interact with other people, um, how to get close quickly in an authentic way. Yeah, That's what people feel and can respond to 
the quickest, yeah. you know, so learning how to operate with your walls down so that people can drop theirs quickly um, in a really authentic way that feels good for people. I like that phrase, by the way. I think it's a very good way to operate. It is because it's a big ask. Sometimes when I'm working, I might only have two, three minutes, this decisive moment with yeah. someone that I'm just meeting right then. And I think the goal is in order to get an image that can touch people, the goal is to get the wall down quick. Mm. It's the the emotional intimacy. And in able to do that with a complete stranger on the fly like that, it's mostly about them being able to connect with you. And they they have to want to connect with you. Yeah. So if I'm doing anything other than my most vulnerable self, which is when you operate with your walls down, how could I ever expect someone to be vulnerable in front of my lens? Which is what you're asking, yeah. you know, when you're using your camera, it's like, hey, can I can I see your soul? Yeah. And then show it to people across the world. So, you know, it, it's a big ask. So I always make the effort first. Well, we're going to come to that in um, in no short measures shortly. What led you to the Navy in the first place, though? I think, well, I'm originally from the mountains of Northern California. Mm. I had a pretty, what we would call, gnarly upbringing. Mm. And my imagination and my the dream of the escape. Um, and I had a good friend of mine. His dad was quite an older fellow, um, and he was in the in the navy and it was always with the sea stories if you've ever known a sailor you know it's always <laughs> with the sea stories <laughs> and these fantastic voyages and i used to just daydream about it and there was a series of events that led me to kind of having my back against the wall as a human being even though i was just a young teenage girl yeah. and i just said oh man i'm gonna get out of here right now and i went down to the recruiting station and took my tests did very 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 well and they said how about this weekend? You want to leave? And I said, let's go. And was it. I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything to bring. Um, I had on a tie dye dress with right. a pair of sandals. The rest is history, as and we say. Was, and that was it. That was it. Yeah. There was no family involvement then in, in the Navy beforehand. No, not no. at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I kind of grew up without a lot of family in mm. my life um, because of my my father was a junkie. Mm. He There was an estrangement, so I never knew his family. Mm. And my mom and him were together when they were teenagers, and she kind of went on this, this wild goose chase with him. Mm. Um, so her family really wasn't involved at all. He was murdered when I was 10 years old. So, yeah. And from then on, I was this wild child yeah. and, a, and a result of um, an explosive upbringing, I guess you could say. So I was into a lot of mature things way before I should have been. And uh, it gave me a lot of guts and a lot of street smarts. And when I saw that door creak open where I could possibly escape, I said, you let's get out of here. Yeah. Let's let the adventure begin, as we say in the Navy. <laughs> uh, we are going to come back to your father later on, if you don't mind, because uh, it is it is an important part of one of your photographic collections. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that. Um, you were one of the first women to serve on the USS Thomas S. Gates, which I did have to look up. My Navy knowledge is not great. I got <laughs> gently excited for a moment when I found out that your ship was made in a in a place where I thought I'd been photographing a wedding opposite this yard, only to find out that I was 200 miles down the coast the other way. <laughs> but for a moment, we had that connection. Uh, but it was it's a class cruiser named after a Secretary of Defence from the Eisenhower administration. And that's where my knowledge ends. <laughs> I was doing well up to that moment. What's it like to serve on board? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned this idea of touring, and it does have that romantic notion of touring around the world. I know that parts of it were anything but romantic, but that initial part of your your life, your service with the with the navy. I remember so clearly as I was pulling into base, my first duty station was a little interesting. I was working with Lockheed Martin at a top secret facility. So when it was time for me to go to my first ship, I had a couple years under my belt. And as I was pulling into the base and I saw the ships and I knew I was going to have to park my car, find my ship, which one was even mine, the sense of dread and fear and excitement and anxiety and, and adrenaline, you know, it was just, it's really hard to describe it, intensity as high as it can go on all those levels. And it's like, 
you know, I had to swallow it all back and stride up, you know, you're, you're just under a magnifying glass. It's hard to describe these ships are massive and looming and, and these imposing figures. And I thought, here we go. And, you know, from the moment you step on board, you're immediately transported into another world. You're, you are in another world. You're, you're removed from civilian life or, you know, landlocked life. Mm. What's the day to day like? Well, it's kind of a beautiful sensation. The moment your ship leaves the pier, you can feel it, even as you're just feet away from it. And as you go far, it doesn't take very long for you to get farther and farther. And you kind of start feeling this cadence and the rhythm of the sea. Um, There's a lot of work to do. It's very, very structured. Lots of cleaning throughout the day. Lots of maintenance on your equipment throughout the day. Lots of gazing. The camaraderie is as quick as you know it. And I think that speaks to the photography, too, because you can't hide who you are out to sea at all because you're with the same people day in, day out, day in. And and your your work hours are long. Mm. So you kind of have to reveal who you are right away there's no hiding anything about about who you are um and it's just settling into this life it's it's a hard life mm. a, a lot of work to do the the environment and this is what's interesting um you know they say haze gray and underway navy ships are this haze gray this color right so it's very neutral so your your environment you're surrounded in is devoid of emotion it's just nothing but cold steel and you know maybe if you don't smoke cigarettes you're not even going to get outside of the skin of the ship so it becomes this maze that you're always in and then even inside of that within your own shop and and within your own group of shipmates that's a world within the world that that cold steel that that doesn't have anything to do with the the name of your website does it is, is there a connection with <laughs> well, it well steel capture uh steel is my last name i know steel is and your last name but i was thinking that playing the two playing together with that steely <laughs> nature that you had to have and and steel capture which sounds very very strong i was thinking oh does this i mean i'm obviously reading it incorrectly i knew i would be the moment i opened my mouth no you're right <laughs> i i live by what my last name represents right. and oh, okay. i've always kind of um hung my hat on that i i am hard as steel yeah. but i also like to be soft as silk on the other side so i like to own both of those things yeah. Now, this is where the next part of the story, particularly within the Navy, this is important because it it does form your your journey. I know it's such an overused word, but but into into photography. You served um, for for some time in South America and you were on drug ops and anti-piracy missions. And and that really took a toll on you mentally, didn't it? It did. You know, month after month, of this type of heightened life. There's anxiety, I would imagine. It it, yeah. it, it puts you always in this state of readiness yes. at any at any moment. Yeah. You know, uh, you have to be ready to go at a at the drop of the hat. And um, you kind of see things and are exposed to things. At the, at the time, it's like, hey, no big deal. That's what we're doing. Mm. But you eventually start filling up like if you can ima- imagine your mind and your heart is a mansion full of rooms and eventually those rooms kind of start getting filled up with these it, at the time they just seem like oh normal normal things but they're actually quite extreme events and it does I- even though you don't realize it at the time it starts informing who you're going to become eventually emotionally and and, and all that stuff so and did hurricane katrina come after those ops so that just added to this whole i mean that that what i read of what you were coping with on a day-to-day basis you were posted there weren't you that that was where your base was so you weren't escaping you weren't able to escape from that area so yeah. um you ended up doing some rather unsavory missions didn't you really and in, in but you were also photographing. So so photography had now appeared, hadn't it? You know, at the time, because uh, I'd always been a little shutterbug. Yeah. I, I've always been completely enthralled with photography. And when the hurricane came, I was on shore duty there for two years and I had my two babies. So I had a six month old and a year and a half old. Yeah. And it just, we, we didn't evacuate. So the step one of that was surviving the hurricane with my best friend you know the whole nine yards swimming through it with my six-month-old 
wow. um, navigating that, almost losing our lives. That that's a whole that's a whole episode of my life that also changed me was mm-hmm. the actual hurricane. But then afterwards, you know, there was so much work to do. This physical labor, and, and we were the ones that were there. It, it's it's hard to describe the enormity of of everything that it affected. And slowly, as like for example, the deep sea divers slowly made their way down and you know they're what one of the primary things was um these fishing vessels that had the, these full families on it mm-hmm. well in a hurricane ships have to go out to sea and all these vessels had kind of went up the waterways so the deep sea divers had to start clearing the waterways and bringing up these vessels and bringing up families that had been in the water for weeks mm-hmm. stuff like this army guys going the cbs clearing clearing roads of cars that were trying to get out just too late because people didn't understand hurricanes are just such a normal thing in the American South. It's not like, oh, no, here comes a big hurricane. Well, if it's the 12th one of the year or whatever it was, it's not a thing. But it was almost too late when people realized, holy cow, this is going to be the biggest one one ever. So, you know, there were roads with cars full of people that never got out, mm-hmm. stuff like this. And at the time, I thought, oh, man, I'm getting one over on everybody because I get to just go around and take pictures. But being even though I had always loved photography, I, I never had any formal training. And what I was doing was I was taking in tremendously disturbing things or yeah. traumatic things through yeah. the lens. And I was actually taking them into myself. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that really, really, really affected me. I think a lot of, um, well, combat photographers that I've spoken to, conflict, combat, war, um, label it as you will, um, not necessarily military ones. I've, um, although I, one of my well, my best friends is, is a former military photographer. So I've had the stories from his angle as well. But um, they have one thing in common when it comes to talking about these these things that they see such as you with the bodies in the water and 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 the missions you'd um, taken part in before as well that there's a certain sense of detachment when you have that camera there that it doesn't um I, I, i'm try, trying not to be too clumsy with this because it's a very real situation but it almost becomes unreal because you're focusing through there's a detachment because you're v- focusing through a lens was that was that the way you were feeling at the, at the time do you think i did I, f- I felt completely unfazed yeah and we had actually sent down um we'll say counselors you know um to kind of check be checking in with people hey and i thought i'm good mm. you know i i felt completely unfazed at all by it it was just something that i did and i i, I felt kind of honored to, to, document to document it. I knew no one else yeah. was there. Yeah. I felt completely unfazed by yeah. it. So you put the camera down though, didn't you? And, and then you didn't pick it up for, for quite a while. And I'm just trying to fill the gaps now between you leaving the Navy and becoming a photographer because there's a, an academy in the middle of all this, which I think the Navy had something to, to do with. I did. When I first got out, I continued my career as an electronics technician, but even more it was even more intense. I was working with emergency centers and climbing mountaintop, you know, transceiver sites and all this stuff. Sounds exciting. It it was. (laughs) And to be quite honest, I was the first woman to do it for them. It was in 2010. My hands were getting really bad, all these years of really hard manual labor. And it was 2010 that someone gave me a camera because I never ever picked up a camera again after Hurricane Katrina. And I just thought it wasn't like that. Oh, I don't want to shoot. It wasn't that. It was just gone from me. Yeah. And in 2010, someone gifted me a camera, Canon Rebel, right. and said, hey, start shooting again. But the problem was every time I would go to do a photo shoot or every time I would go to shoot, uh, there was just this tremendously overwhelming feeling of anguish. Oh, I hated it the sweating, the anxiety. I felt like, oh, I couldn't do it good. Um, It was just tremendously way over the top emotional suffering for it. Mm. And then I would do the shoot and it was like the highest level euphoria. It was almost like, excuse the glibness, but it was almost like doing drugs afterwards. A complete, the the, the chemical release was like Mm. so euphoric. So it was like the, the worst feeling and then skyrocketing to the best feeling, completely emotionally dysregulated, specifically with the camera, even though I had already started suffering PTSD, that was already something I was dealing with. But this was like that 
amplified. Yeah. And I thought um, people were still trying to encourage me, mentors. I was entering my work in a contest, winning contests, exhibiting, but it was still excruciating for me. And I thought, man, I'm not going to be able to climb Mount Everest with a camel on my back. Yeah. And um, I Googled best photography school in the world, because that's part of if you pay into it, the GI Bill, especially post 9-11. And lo and behold, the school in San Francisco came up, Academy of Art University, because I've always I've always wanted to be this the best. You know, I, I have something in me that always wants to be the most the best. And I thought, let's go. You met some very in, uh, encouraging people within the Academy. I think it was one one particular gentleman, wasn't there, that, that, that encouraged you through this? It was, to be honest, it was so intense for me. When I first started my first year at the Academy, my PTSD was so incredible. Right. The shakes I had. And I would be driving until I moved to where I live now. I was for a four-hour drive into San Francisco. Right. And I was doing that multiple times a week, plus keeping up with the shooting. I would have to pull over and have these little almost pass outs. Mm. That's how bad it was for me. And I finally encountered a professor. His name's Kent Marshall. Yeah. He really changed my life. And he was this old school, a little bit more of a harder edge, which is that's that's right up my alley. And he taught me um, a method. He taught me a process so that he could say no. Your brain's going to go one, two, three, four, five. And all of a sudden, my brain started forming these new pathways. I could literally feel it. Mm. I felt it during that semester. By the end, I thought, I'm going to win this battle. I'm going to be able to do it because now I had a process. And he's still even to this day. He's someone I respect so much. Um, and I always say, you you healed my photographic PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> but you do believe that the, the creativity is, and, and again, it's a subject we've touched on before, uh, the paramedics, the uh, those in the forces. Doesn't that just have to be forces? I mean, PTSD comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, as, we, as, we've, as we've discovered on, on, on this programme, with those that we've spoken to. But creativity, photography... As, as a conduit to, to, I don't want to sound too woo-woo, but f find yourself and 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 stabilise yourself. It's something that you truly believe in, isn't it? I do. Um, when your brain goes through these traumatic events, the path uh, in some areas uh, to get from point A to point B might be broken. Yeah. So then there's this constant clunking, I guess you could say. But when you start stimulating yourself in other ways and other ways of thinking, new pathways can form. And then all of a sudden there's a smoothness yeah. and a kind of a control you can start to, you have to remaster your mind. And there's something about creativity that is stimulating to your brain in another way where it's, it, it heals, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, I, I believe you. Um I, I need to fill the gaps again now, though, because I know that there was a period where you had a photographic studio and you were sharing with artists, but then uh, and you were winning awards and and you were making gains. But it's twenty twenty, isn't it? Where where it was, this is a pretty good place to start with your collections. That's when the traction really really starts, isn't it? In the uh, the initial weeks of something horrible. I still find it very hard to say the name. I get told off for this. People say, why don't you just call it COVID or the pandemic, Neil? I still, it's like the Voldemort of words for me. It really is. <laughs> but tell me about how you covered that, that period in history. Is, is this the Shelter in Place project? Yes, it's a, it is. It's, it's a great project. I, thank you so much. I, um, I'm an avid runner. And I think, and I don't know if this is common for everyone else, but as soon as the Shelter in Place started, it was like, whoa, Something is happening right yeah, now. I could yeah. feel in every just cell in my body. And I was out running one night and all the houses were full. And then I, I live in Sacramento, which is the capital of California. There wasn't a single car on the road. There wasn't a single other runner. And I said, wow, yeah. look at how empty everything is and how full the streets are. And my across the street neighbor, they'd never had. A, so my mind, you know, you're running, you're thinking of other things. And I was supposed to do their daughter's senior portrait. And I thought, wow, I couldn't even do their portrait right now if I wanted. And then I thought, well, that's funny because they always have their front windows open. I guess I could do it through their front window. And I thought, whoa, you know, your thoughts when you come up with ideas, they happen very, very quickly. And I thought, 
wow, I could, and I could do it so stunningly. And it could be a formal family portrait that they could have for generations to show how beautiful it is. And it could be hopeful for them. And I thought, pardon the language, I thought, you know, holy shit, I could do it in every household. Because there's no, it, it was the great unifier, right? The shelter in place. It was the, you know, the, the single dad and the daughter in the trailer park. Mm -hmm. And then these like millionaires mm -hmm. in their mansions. It, it was everybody and everywhere. And immediately, because my photographic mind was already stimulated from the master's program, this I thought, oh man, boom, let's do it. And, and I knew you better do it quick because you can also sense it was a moment and it passed quickly too, you know. I was looking at the the pictures and, and I, I sort of applied the word oxygen tents. They all look like they're in their oxygen tents. I mean, I will share the collection on the uh, the show page so you can go and look for it for yourself. There were some interesting places though, weren't there? What was the one I, I'm thinking about? The um, It's almost like a doll's house uh, and a sort of adult sized doll's house. Yeah. And, you know, some of these places were way up in Northern California and mm -hmm. that one I think that you're referring to is this tiny 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 little micro house That's maybe right. yeah. 100 200 square feet stacked on top of each other yeah her living in the downstairs and her son living upstairs and these little micro and he's just peering out the window you know I thought <laughs> oh man me I just felt so lucky every time I could discover another way of telling the stories mm. of, of uh, how many stories there were and i thought oh man that's cool now people get to see that too yeah. how, how did you manage to reach out to them because um i don't know whether your area i mean every, every part of the country was different the way that they dealt with it obviously but uh, I, I know that here people will be throwing themselves into hedges just to get nowhere near the other person if you'd walk to somebody's somebody's door they might just go away it's like the the, the, old, the old english plague of london it was like don't come anywhere near the door how, how are you uh, how are you approaching people a lot of these people i knew as the weeks were going on i kind of could already see visually where i wanted to go i knew i wanted the hermit guy yeah. with the felt hat you oh, know yes. yeah, I, yeah. I knew i wanted to tell the story of, about that i knew we needed to tell also the story about the senior citizens sheltering by their place so as it as the project got further along i could kind of see the different flavors that i needed to also include in there and you know maybe friends of friends or um i had some people reach out to me via social media hey my parents are you know they've been together for 75 years i saw another project of yours with people that were married over 50 years yeah. could you do that kind of for them now here so word of mouth in a way a little boldness but it doesn't hurt to ask and uh, rachel still returns for part two of our conversation soon in the background faintly as i make my walk this morning you might well be able to hear it's this sort of early morning trickle of of uh, lorries going in and out and forklift trucks and stuff at the local chutney factory i reckon you can smell it through this podcast <laughs> i always go home feeling oh faintly hungry at the end of this walk i used to wonder why but then uh, somebody said, it's the chutney factory. That's what it is. It's the chutney factory. It's the chutney factory. It's a big chutney factory. It certainly is. Um, the noise of the forklifts do, do irritate me slightly, but uh, hopefully they won't be too omnipresent. We have, um, we have one episode left this year as I'm taking the week off between Crimbles and the new year, so I am. Uh, there will be an extra mile. I'm planning for it. Depends how much eggnog we consume, clearly. But there will be, there's a plan to be, an extra mile on the 29th. So, uh, New Year around the corner. I would love to hear from you. Uh, in particular, your plans, actually. Not resolutions, necessarily. Plans. Uh, photographic plans, yes. Uh, because I think plans, they can be elastic, Whilst resolutions, they just make us feel guilty, don't they? So creative and walking plans for 2024, plus the pictures that you've been making and the stories that you've been telling, perhaps over the holiday period. That would be fun. If, uh, if you're making some photo walks, let's see where you've been walking off the, uh, the banquets that you've been having in parts of the world, anyway. Where do we go here, pups? I'm trying to navigate my way through the, uh, all the thistles and stuff here so we can escape the noise of the early morning forklift at the chutney factory you're right pups you got a stick 
lovely. So send your pictures into the email address, which is your pictures and stories, that is, to stories at photowalk.show. Stories at photowalk.show. If you're sending pictures in, please don't watermark them. Don't put borders and things around them. But uh, please do send me your Flickr accounts, your Instagrams, etc., so that I can make sure we link to you correctly. And if you can resize them to 2,500 pixels, that would be fabulous. If you can't, don't worry. Send in the full res. I'll do the heavy lifting. T-shirt, please. Merch required for that phrase. All right, let's get across this. Very boggy this morning. I think we've escaped the forklift. That's the main thing. That's the thing about walking around the perimeter. You end up walking next to all the industrial bits because they now are in the hangars, which once housed these huge um, aircraft, the strata fortresses. Strato, strato. You say strato, I'll say strato. Let's call the whole war off. All right, the assignment for this month, and then I'm going to tell tell you about my book. Is that okay? Go on, Neil. All right. I'm interested to hear about it. I mean, you've been teasing it. It's about time it was out. Assignment for this month. There are a couple of photographs on the assignments page for this month, um, but I'm going to give you extra time over the holiday break to go make a picture of a bird. Now, this is the challenge part because there is a particular angle, a particular feel to the challenge set by photographer Dwayne Patton, the Australian photographer Dwayne Patton, with that just enormously moving story of uh, having had a heart attack at age 31, changing his life, becoming a photographer, making photographs of wildlife. I know, I know pups, I'm amazed too. But because I think he'll do it more justice than me, describing the assignment, that is, if you'll lend me 90 seconds, like you did last week, let's just run across the assignment for this month. An assignment I do intend to do. Actually, I received um, a message from uh, extra miler Andrew Hardacre, who said, getting down on your, on your belly at this time of year. Mind you, he's in Hong Kong. And I suggested he takes out one of his yoga mats. That's a slight clue to what's coming up now. The photo walk assignment. Dwayne, let's go for an assignment from you. I'm not sure whether this will be something to do with birding or wildlife or it probably is going to be along that line, isn't it? Yes, definitely. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask everybody to get up early. Mm-hmm. I know some people don't like to get up what early. What is early, by the way, in your language? Before the sun comes up. <laughs> So okay. I, want, I, th- I want you to go to a local wetland, right? somewhere where there's water birds, uh, ducks or swans or whatever they might be, and I want you to get there before the sun has come up. And then I want you to get into a position <laughs> that you can get to as low to the water as you can that is comfortable without exposing yourself too much. The lower you can get, the better. So wetland, early, get down nice and low, and then wait for the sun to start coming up. Mm-hmm. And once that sun starts to come up, try to capture that early morning light with some sort of water bird going about its business, whether it's a duck or a swan. And you can go as wide as you want or as um, narrow as you want. And I'm sure you'll have a great time and capture some beautiful shots. I was going to ask about the lens, but you said go wide or as long as you like. So that that's correct. It's not about the kit, this, is it? Not at all. Any camera or lens. It's more about getting out into the field mm-hmm. and just experiencing nature, listening to the wildlife, listening to the birds, and just watching them go about their business. There's something very rewarding and relaxing about watching wildlife just go about. And if you can get a capture and a memento of that and beautiful light, oh, nothing beats it. So good luck with this assignment. Send your entries in to stories at photowalk.show. Stories at photowalk.show. 2,500 pixels wide if you can optimise your your picture for that. If you can't, don't worry. Send in the full resolution one and we'll do the heavy lifting. Right. Would you mind if um, I shared something that I've just made? I'd like to tell you about the book, which is odd, actually, because it's Studio Neil now passing to Studio Neil uh, to tell you about the book that we've just written. This is very strange. Well, it's taken a while, but why? A sketchbook of life, edition one, the ebook is out. I've been asking now for a fair while, and spoiler alert, I will ask again today my guest Rochelle Steele 
what is your why? Most of my guests interpret that to be an and finally question that's trying to unpick why they picked their camera up. Uh, but as you'll hear with Rochelle, it's more introspective for others, with hints of something that could probably become an extra interview in itself. And in Why, a sketchbook of life, I published 20 answers received on the show that come to mind when considering the question, why? Some very recent and some taken from the archives of this podcast. Excuse me, though, as I turn the camera back toward me on this occasion, because I've never really asked me. And having asked so many others about theirs, I wanted, if you will, to have a go at it myself. So this, my first ebook, leads with that question. And I find a long tail chapter answered to it. I suppose or hope it might actually have more of us in this community consider it personally too. My why is answered partly through a personal recollection from a particular Wednesday in 2009 on a day when one chapter was closing and another opening, if you take books as a metaphor. A closely allied to the theme of my walks has been another constant. Alongside that search for an answer to the why of photography, or indeed life sometimes, there's sketchbooking with a camera. Art was one of the subjects at school I enjoyed, and actually into my early 20s, I kept small sketchbooks which, being textured watercolour paper form, enabled me to revisit one of the few things I really did enjoy about school, and that was line drawing and paint. The sketchbooks were gradually lost over time, and though I tried to rekindle the spirit of them in the last decade, I began to enjoy the process of the camera being my sketchbook instead. Embracing that idea that we have well, the most incredible tool to be an aid memoir of life. The two constants of this show and now my creative life, why and sketchbooking, come together in this. I share 50 sketchbook photographs made out on my walks, walks that many times have been made with you. Some with recollections, others simply a nod to the idea of just stopping, looking, breathing in with curiosity and out with the gentle squeeze of the shutter button. Sketchbooking with a camera has become my way of visually breathing, and this is the first time I've attempted to loosely sequence my observations. This ebook brings these constants together then, and is also a, a very good way to support the show as I try to build this community of kindness that I really believe that we're building together. The book sales will go toward the technical costs of the show and the time taken to produce a weekly, long-tail, mostly self-funded project. So it's also a way to support the programme as we continue to walk together in 2024. Why a Sketchbook of Life is out now, available as an e-book download through the website, photowalk.show. Just look for the menu item, Book. And thank you for being a part of this journey. Thank you, Studio Neil. Yes, the book is out. And, uh, well, really, it's a way to support the show as much as anything. But uh, I've spent a lot of time and I have laboured over this book. It's not the longest book. As e-books go, it's pretty long. Um, but uh, I've really enjoyed putting it together putting my sketchbook photographs in there, telling the stories about some of them. Anyway, I've told you this stuff. <laughs> Don't go over it again, Neil. You're repeating, repeating yourself. And good luck for the assignment, uh, for, your, for your picture that you're going to make for the assignment of the bird at ground level, at dawn. Look, if one of those doesn't come together, don't panic too much, as they say. Um, <laughs> one out of three, two out of three, what is it? Dawn, belly, bird. Yeah, two out of three. Shall we say, t let's do a deal. It's my early Christmas gift to you. Two out of the three. If you get three out of three, perfect. Free eggnog all round. Right, here's one from, um, from Joshua Hale in Ottawa in Canada land. I'm getting told off, by the way, at the moment, for putting land. <laughs> it was one of the biggest complaints on the, on the listener survey. Stop saying land. Even Sam, my wife, said stop saying land. God, it's the week of being in trouble. I mean, if it's not Don. Anyway, dear Neil, says uh, Josh, Joshua, I'm writing 
to you for the first time, although I've been listening to your show with my dad, who shared the show with me originally for over a year. Thank you, Mr. Hale Senior. Uh, Neil, lay off the senior if you don't mind, all right. I find your guests very interesting, and it's fascinating to learn about different types of photography and the photographers who've chosen the various subspecialities of photography. The guests and their stories give me access to other regions and countries in the world, and for that, I want to thank you, Neil. That's the wonderful thing about podcasting, though, isn't it, Josh? Can I call you Josh? That, uh, I mean, if you'd have said... I know I've said this before, but honestly, if you'd have said to a fledgling uh, radio presenter, Neil, all those many, many years ago, one day you're going to be broadcasting, that's essentially what it is, to an audience around the world, and you won't need a thumping great big AM transmitter in every single corner of the world or desert. Then I'd have said, Phew, how much eggnog have you had, Grandma? Because I'd have never believed you. But you can, and that's the, that's the fantastic and the fabulously interesting thing for me as well, Josh, is being able to talk to people, uh, photographers around the world, uh, chatting to people that I, I never would have otherwise dreamed I'd be able to. The power of Zoom or Skype, other systems available, and the power of podcasting, all as one happy team, huh? Since this is my first time writing into you, I thought I'd send you the name of a Canadian photographer called Michelle Valberg. Now, she is a Canadian wildlife photographer who is from Ottawa in Canada. I've included the website for you, or her website. So thank you for that. I'll make sure I put that on the, the show page today. And Josh, I looked at uh, her work and uh, immediately I thought, whoa, there we go. Another person we just have to talk to on the show. So... I sent her an email straight away to Michelle, so I did, and she sent one pretty much straight away back saying, yeah, would love to come on the show. She's actually travelling at the start of the year doing another one of her photographic expeditions. So we've got a bit of a, well, sort of a, a, a tight amount of time at the moment if I want to make sure this is on the first few weeks of the year. Otherwise, when I return from Africa myself, tail end of, well, it's start of February, then uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch base then and chat. But her work is exquisite. From her bio, Michelle Valberg, a renowned wildlife photographer and esteemed Nikon ambassador, so she is, has spent over three decades captivating audiences with her extraordinary storytelling through the lens. Her photographic journey has taken her to the farthest reaches of the globe, where she fearlessly seeks out thrilling adventures and remarkable photographic opportunities. Throughout her work, Michelle's deep-rooted love for Canada and the Arctic shines through in her breathtaking imagery. And the Arctic, actually, is where she's off to. Her intimate pictures of the, uh, the polar bears that I was pouring over, Josh, uh, they're playing and nursing and hunting and sleeping after hunting. Uh, they're amazing. And uh, <laughs> I am sure I will be asking the question, how do you get that close? Because some of them don't look necessarily like they were taken on, well, with long focal lengths. They, well, to me, I'm probably wrong. They look a lot closer. Not quite 16 millimetre close. I'm not sure <laughs> you can or should do that with a polar bear. So, uh, so thank you, Josh. Great suggestion, straight on the case, and uh, you'll hear her in the new year at some stage. Sooner or later, but you will hear her. P.S. says Josh Garibaldi's are awesome. We need to talk, you and I, about the word awesome, because um, <laughs> it's a word that's applicable to volcanoes, the northern lights and being chased by a polar bear because you left the 1,000 millimetre in the car. That, that's an awesome thing. They are awesome things. But uh, otherwise, I'm not sure Garibaldi's are awesome. Uh, it's a squeamishness that I've had, uh, <laughs> down to really influencers across the world calling blueberry muffins awesome. Anyway, shall we take a few moments for visual stories? Yes. This week, eye contact. Now, I know for some members of our photographic community who uh, like to spend time photographing on the street, eye contact is not necessarily something you look for, certainly not in candid pictures anyway. It's, uh, it's that sort of thou shalt not or does this make it candid anymore kind of photograph. But 
as Valerie is going to point out, is it all that bad? Does eye contact spoil the nature of candid photography on the street? And what about pictures of kids on the street? It's a subject that comes up over and over, I know. And I... I well, <laughs> it sounds like one, but I never make apologies for it because I think it's such an important subject when it comes to uh, street photography and candid street photography and portraits. So, yes, it's a subject we do reach out to now and then, and Valerie will talk about it today is visual stories for december now we, we've um this is interesting because it's it's a, a sort of two stories really we've got um pictures of children because as you said to me it is an important subject to discuss in street photography and, it, and it's one where i think people feel really awkward actually al almost awkward to discuss it as well and then we've got pictures of eye contact and the two sort of play into each other I've yeah. got a good few images from you. So do you mind if I choose what goes here and what goes on extra mile? Yeah, I'm, go ahead. I'm going to choose the f the very first one you sent to me. It's a gorgeous image. And actually, it's a picture that could have been taken in the 50s. It's just simply called Child in a Car because it's one of those, those wonderful, I was going to say Art Deco design cars, which probably shows I know nothing about the design of cars. Um, but it's a lovely image. There's eye contact and a child in this picture. Yes. So we get double mm -hmm. bubble with this one, don't we? Yes. I never try to make eye contact. Actually, I avoid it. But sometimes um, it's what makes the photograph more interesting. And actually, the selection that I gave you about eye contact, they all made the photograph much more interesting. Uh, I don't ever provoke it for simple reasons. I wouldn't want somebody to just shove a camera in my face no. and make me look up and then snap a picture of me and then uh, it was kind of a, a thing like i remember seven eight years ago you'd see those videos on on youtube of photographers just just going really close to someone who's sitting at a cafe waiting for them to look up take the picture like deer in the headlight look yeah. and then move on and i was like why just what I don't want to be done to me, I don't do it to other people. But sometimes the the person just takes notice of you as yeah. you're taking the picture. And this picture would have been better to talk about when it comes to children photography, because I find that with children, if you can make the photograph, an appealing photograph without, without revealing the face of the child, I think it's a good way to approach uh, street photography when children are involved, uh, and especially in some countries. But this one is a child in a car who is actually making eye contact with me, but it was at a car show. And um, I did get a shot of her just looking ahead. And then all of a sudden she looked at me and the moment was too good to pass the way we only see half her face and um, how she's making eye contact with me. I. I grabbed the shot. And then this one, yeah, I really like this. There's something very timeless. And it's not about the car. However, we have enough of the car to know that it is know, a fifties yeah. car. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of photographing children then, what what are your what are your thoughts? What are your if you like rules to, to photograph well, children? It's a case by case thing, in my opinion. I can't say do it, don't do it. If you do it, don't hide behind a zoom lens. I think that's actually creepy. really creepy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I saw it recently in Paris when my photographers were photographing children around the pond in the Luxembourg Garden where the children are pushing those little wooden boats. Oh, yeah. And there are lovely shots of children because it's kind of crowded. You can actually get close, get a really nice angle where you see the part of the child's face and then you see them pushing the boat. You can get some really beautiful candid shots. And there are so many people take pictures. It's pretty easy to do up close. But then at one point, from across the pond, I saw a guy with a, a probably a 300 millimeter photographing children, uh, like just their faces from across the pond. And that was so uncomfortable to yeah. me. I think that's sneaky. And if you're going to do it, do it the right way. Do it close, like street photography is supposed to be done. Don't hide behind a zoom lens. You might as well behind, you know, hide in a, a behind a tree or in a bush. It's, it's just, yeah. that's, that's creepy. What if a parent came to you and said, well, what's this picture for? What are you using it for? Why are you making pictures of my child? What would you say? Oh, and, and, uh, I have no problem saying, I mean, it's such a, a beautiful moment to, 
immortalize. And I show them that it's done in a very respectful manner, especially if they're young children, because you know very well, if it's a child that's under eight years old, they're not alone at the park or in the street. So there is a parent really, really close, even if they're not holding hands, they're very close. So in a situation like that, always try to figure out who the parent is. And then if possible, and it's happened actually for one of the pictures I sent you, I made eye contact with the father who was sitting on a park bench. And that's the little girl at the fountain. I was sitting on the park bench and he saw what I saw. He saw the moment of the little girl with the sun going through her hair and she's about to crawl into the fountain but she's it's so precious and so timeless so i pointed the camera i didn't have to speak to him i didn't even get close to him and he just gave me a thumbs up so the point was not to disrupt what i was seeing so i didn't want the little girl to see me so i got closer and closer and framed the shot and then moved on we didn't have a conversation but if i do have a conversation with a parent usually parents will have uh, snapshots of their kids you know smiling at them but a candid moment uh, it's a gift yeah, and yeah, I'm so yeah. happy when I can share that. Well actually on that front then since you mentioned silhouettes this is a beautiful mm-hmm. one this one uh, again simple title children's silhouettes there's three children playing in the uh, in the in the in the low surf of um, well loosely surf of a beach this this is a moment where you you can't recognize you can't identify exactly. any, any of the children so it's what you might call a, a fairly safe street i know it's at the sea but fairly s- safe street shot in that respect um, absolutely silhouettes are uh, a good way to do uh, street photography if you're a little concerned about revealing faces or publishing faces of strangers on social media there is always a way to go around the the problem and uh, i mean i wrote a book called anonymous for that reason because some people are concerned of of the privacy laws which are so great and and people are not really informed and i love photographing an expression in a beautiful moment and there is nothing that will ever beat you know photographing of the expression of a, of a face yes. but if people are a little nervous they can certainly be a little bit more minimalist and they, they can still practice street photography and capturing moments of everyday life in a more conspicuous way just like silhouettes and here those three children are playing i'm shooting into the sun at low light and there are three children playing and uh, the gestures are there the separation is there it just it worked well we know what they're doing but they could be anyone actually that, so, that that's good advice if you if, if you do feel a bit awkward about taking photographs and mm-hmm. being able to recognize people within a photo or identify people within a photograph going out low light um yep. and in shooting this this case light. shooting into the light of course um that, that that's probably quite good for your confidence isn't it absolutely and it's you know i'm pretty far i mean i don't bring the camera to my eye anyway so nobody could really nobody yeah. really know i mean i'm shooting as i'm walking when i get this type of shots i'm, I'm walking in the water taking pictures so uh <laughs> that it but then it really if people see me i have no problem telling them what i'm doing either it's uh you're not doing anything wrong and i think that's something photographers have to get used to yeah. because if they feel like they're doing something wrong you they will probably it. send yeah. that they yes. look at they send yeah. that vibe that's yeah. going to make everybody uncomfortable so yeah. uh if you do it do it right do it close and yes the the two other pictures i sent you of children we see just the yeah. back uh, of them it's a little bit harder to make it work. Child, because Child of the Canal is is the first one. Yes. Yep, yep. And that's a grab shot that's as I one. was walking by over uh, on the bridge. Yeah. And um, we don't need to see the expression. We know there is excitement there. He's watching the, the locks yeah. open at the Canal Saint-Martin in Paris. And uh, we don't need to see his expression. We, we can imagine it. And that's also the beauty is to l- leave room for the imagination. So I think you can do it with respect, even with young children. And no, it's not easier for women than it is for men because I've experienced uh, on workshops, some some men on my workshop that got the most beautiful close-up pictures of children because they were feeling at ease and they didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They did respectfully and they were ready to to explain what they were doing if they were asked so or they asked permission so there are so many ways you can do it if you're really really nervous then you're better off just making a portrait just ask the parent oh can i do a portrait of your child if they say okay 
then do it. Do a good job. Share the picture with them. Uh, at least you have permission. If you're really, really that uncomfortable getting a candid shot of a child, then it's just not for you. Um, so it's for me, it's really a case by case. Sometimes the moment is just too good to miss and the child's face is visible, but I know you cannot interpret it any other way than you know the story I'm I'm seeing. So you just have to follow your follow your gut on this one. On the extra mile, I'm going to talk about two particular images. I'm saving back. It's reli- it's religion. It'll be re- re- religion. <laughs> oh, that's themed. right. <laughs> and and what, well, I like them both, but the one of the nuns. See that starts to. We've talked often, and I'll just tease you with this. We've talked often myself and Valerie about. Making pictures that don't make fun of people, mm-hmm. in a cruel sense, that is. And one of them, I think, is, is close-ish to that. In, in a co- it's humour. And it was humour. So we don't want to say too much. Don't say too much. But I, <laughs> I, I, want, I want to lead into that with an eye contact picture, though, the final one for today. And, yeah. and I absolutely adore this because this – see, I, what I love is I love timeless images. I suppose the child, the child at the fountain – all these pictures will be on the show page, by the way. The child in, in the fountain is definitely the one with the car that we started our conversation with. They fit into the timeless category. But this one, eye contact with the lady on the bus – that for me, that could so easily be a 50s, 60s picture. I don't know when this is taken. Um, I don't know what decade. And I like it for that reason. And she is giving you eye contact. Definitely through her dark glasses. Definitely. That was actually on the train in New York. Right. That was at Grand Central and the train was about to leave. Ah. And that was probably five, six years ago. So um, I haven't been doing this for that long. So none of my pictures are going to be older than about 12 years yeah, old. Well, we're not anyway. talking about the 60s and 70s, are we? No. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it could be. So, so looking at this picture, it yeah, has it that timeless be. quality yeah. to it. Yeah. And that's the thing. When I, when I photograph people, I don't photograph people on their phones. And that's... It's tough because if you walk along the platform looking in, everybody's on their phone, right? Yeah. So so the goal when I'm there and, and I, I bring uh, my workshop students to Grand Central and, and we cover that area of Grand Central Station as well, just walking down the tracks when the train is about to leave, is capturing that moment that really stands out. So either someone making eye contact with you, I've had people, you know, play the guitar, people reading books, people yeah. holding their dogs. Uh, so it's it's about capturing something that's different than what you expect, right? And so here she's making, yeah, she's making eye contact with me, but in a way that doesn't doesn't look very friendly, right? <laughs> if you're going to get eye contact and the subject is on a train that's about to leave, yeah. uh, it's a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. It's said, probably they, creepier, but more they, comfortable. Well, they certainly <laughs> can't come and ask you for, for what you're going to do with the picture because they're, exactly. they're, they're out of the platform. I do want to ask you one, one last question, actually, for today. And, and that is, um, I, I don't know whether you've answered this before. You might, may have done. I've slept since then. What, why don't you like pictures? of people on phones oh i mean i have some when it was still a novelty but now it's like ah well first (laughs) of all you don't see the face uh the only time a phone is actually good for photography is if it's nighttime and it's actually illuminating you know illuminating the face and it can be a beautiful black and white picture with that light but i'd rather have someone daydream with a cigarette during their break than you know being on their phone and there's so little of that so it's really looking for the nugget you know the the it's it becomes a treasure hunt and i like that if i was photographing people on their phone they would get really boring quickly and uh and they're not interesting stories they're everybody's doing the same thing and it's boring so i want to capture the the unusual and now not being on a phone when you're in public transportation is Is very unusual (laughs) and my thanks to valerie jardin who will return of course in 2024 to talk more about photography as a monthly contributor Um, although she's back on the extra mile this week somebody who returns to the show earlier than the turn of new year Uh, If I may do a a plug for next week's show, is Tony Lorenzo, who really did inspire and surprise you with his letter about a girl called June. So much so that I thought it would be great to have him back to talk for a few moments more on the Christmas edition of The Extra Mile. Um, Although there's a lot more to the story that you originally heard. And the letter was... I thought the letter went into quite some detail, but... 
When I found out more about the story, uh, there was a we have to talk about this on the show moment. Um, it's a it's going to be a program next week, and I think it's good timing for a Christmas edition or a holidays edition to talk about legacy, family, family photography, legacy photography. There's a whole load of personal stuff uh, to come in that particular um, episode. And um, well, whilst we're talking about family and legacy, I, I watched a film, which I don't know how I missed this actually. It's about a year old, I think. It's one from our friend Sean Tucker. Uh, I know, two weeks in a row from Sean. But this is, uh, well, I want to play you a moment from a film that he made a year ago about the passing of his grandmother. The saving grace me in those years was my grandmother, Emmy, because on some weekends I was allowed to travel up to Birmingham to go and stay in her little flat. And from the minute that I walked in through the door, she made sure that I felt loved and cared for and maybe even a little spoiled. Soon after arriving, she would walk me down to the high street to go and get supplies, and she would make me hold her hand. I now know, obviously, it's because she didn't want me to walk into traffic, but she pretended it was to help pull her along because she wanted to learn how to walk faster, and she made up these little stories. And we would go down to the shops and we'd pick up usually a McDonald's Happy Meal, a big two-liter bottle of red, fizzy, sweet, carbonated goodness she used to call cherry pop, and a whole treasure trove of sweets. And our supply run also often included a trip to WH Smith to go pick up a film on a VHS tape. Yes, kids, I'm old. And that's actually the first time I remember watching the original Star Wars trilogies, was buying it at the newsagents with my grandmother, Emmy, to take back to her flat and watch. And any time I watch Star Wars these days, she always comes to mind. No one in my life has shown me the kind of unconditional love that she showed me, and I will always remember her for that, and be incredibly grateful for how she helped me through especially that difficult time in my life. And even though she lived to the ripe age of 96 before she passed away, her loss is still a tough one to take, and I will dearly miss her presence in this world. Since her passing, I've done what most of us do, and I've gone around trying to find every photograph of her I can, so I can keep them in a safe place and pull them out any time I want to bring her back fresh in my memory. I've heard it said that people die twice, once when their heart stops beating, and again the last time someone says their name. And When I thought about that idea, that quote, that little bit of philosophy, I thought that's also true of photographs because we use photographs to pull them out and to re-conjure the memory of that person and to bring them back into our mind as if they were still with us. Wise words from Sean Tucker about family photography. Next week is about family, although the family that Tony's going to talk about is a family he didn't know he had. And he still doesn't, I mean, it's not officially Tony's family, but the story, I think, makes him, well, makes him the, the keeper of that uh, family's history. A very small family, as you will find out. So, uh, yeah, next week, that's, what, uh, that's what's on the show. That's who I'm talking to. And I think I might even be making an actual photo walk in Oxford because he's quite close with Tony to tell the story. Let me get a... Oh, hang on. <laughs> Peek too early. This is uh, one of those things I was talking about earlier that you find up at Greenham Common. 125th, F4, ISO 400. This is a, well, it would have been once upon a time, a boundary fence, a security fence. And it's just a lone pillar, like a lone tree. It's a lone pillar. And um, this is not the only one, actually. There's a few, but not many. And uh, I think they were left as reminders of what the place used to be, like the fire hydrants and the wiring looms that grow out of bushes. So, uh, there we go. Oh, in fact, different angle looks even better. If I take it from the other angle, I shoot it through the bushes. It appears like it's coming out of the bushes, uh, which looks actually much more interesting than the composition I just made. Excuse me, take two. There we go. And then it's a sort of a silhouette as well. F4, 220, ISO 160. We had a nice conversation the other day. We did uh, our pop-up, our Southern Hemisphere Zoom pop-up. We have now two Zooms for extra milers in the month. Um, you don't have to live in the Southern Hemisphere to join us on the Southern Hemisphere Zoom live show pop-up. Must work on a shorter, snappier title because you could be in Europe. You probably won't be in America because you might be asleep while that particular one's on. Um, but... Uh, we were talking about the... Well, somebody very kindly said on the, 
on that uh, Zoom show, the live show, that uh, he enjoyed the feeling or, or seeing where we walk each week with uh, the sketchbooks. There are times when I think, oh, do we need a sketchbook this week? Do you need my pictures? Because there's such a lot of lovely pictures and films and reference things on the show page on the website. You might not need mine, but it was a, a reminder... And actually, having just... Have I told you about my book, which involves sketchbooks, sketchbook images? Then, uh, yeah, there's a good reason to be to be making them. I think that's going to be... Well, I know that's going to be one of my main projects next year. Possibly an Instagram, just with my sketchbooks on them. Oh, Neil, another job. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, anyway, next week's show is going to be a real eye-opener, I think. It's uh, a, Or ear-opener. It certainly is, and I'm looking forward to bringing that to you as our, as our holiday special. So, part two, shall we return back to the second part of my conversation this week with the photographer, Rachel Steele. And we were talking about uh, Shelter in Place, the project, the collection that you made during the, uh, the, the initial lockdown, as we call it, in the, the pandemic. Another uh, collection that you worked on during that time was um, a fantastically simple idea called Quarantine Macros, which really is is photographs of flowers, beautiful things in your front yard. A a very, very, I mean, a a superb idea for its simplicity, really. Yeah, that was, those were literally, and that is why I did those ones, because I wanted to show, look at your front yard, because there was so much depression people were having to fight, and also creative blocks, big time. Yeah. You know, because what what could they do? How could they maneuver creatively? And so I thought, let me do something really beautiful, romantic. I like I like my work to look romantic, but just in my front yard. Yeah. And my big brother's my neighbor, so that was in my yard, and, and his yard, and my neighbor's front porch. So I wanted to show, maybe and inspire a little bit. You can also look within. You can look yeah. within your own little micro world and create something fantastic. Absolutely, and it worked really beautifully. Um, we're going to leap across the map now, Morocco. I like this idea, by the way, of having a residency in Morocco. How, how did that happen and what was that about? When I discovered the residency in Morocco, I had graduated with my master's. I had put out about 150 job applications without a single callback, <laughs> of course, you know how that is. But while I was doing that, I also thought, because I had won Best in Show, I had all this stuff under my belt already. And I thought, what's the most fantastic reward I could ever imagine for myself, what is the most, I always say, what's the most selfish thing I could ever do for myself? And I discovered after a little a little bit of hunting around, I discovered this residency wow. in Morocco wow. where you go with the um, kind of a agreement that at the end I'm going to exhibit a show. Yes. And I thought I could not, my brain couldn't even imagine anything more fantastic than creating a body of work in Morocco and then exhibiting in in the country. Yeah. Uh, and that was, that's kind of where, you know, it took off from there. And then I, I ended up circling back on my own and doing uh, about a 2000 mile expedition with about 200 bucks in my pocket, which was crazy. But see, there was me, there was, there was me thinking, well, clearly um, th- there must've been a, a good amount of money behind this project, but you will be the second voice in as many weeks to say, ah, ah, ah. No, 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 no. I went out with a modest amount. I made it work. Yeah. Me and my good friend, Nofal, he was my assistant and translator. Sometimes it was a bowl of soup a day. Mm. (laughs) I mean, you do what you got to do because there wasn't anything I wasn't willing to sacrifice to create the work. And, And that's just who I am. There's nothing I won't sacrifice. I can go low. I can go low. And that kind of comes from my beginnings, too. I know how low I can go. Uh, and, and I know what I can do on very, very, very little. I have very low expectations for comfort and stuff like that. Like, I can I can suffer a little bit. <laughs> now, I love Africa. You cl- clearly, you do as well. What What did you find about Africa that played, yeah. played to you? Not just to cr- your creative sense, but you as a person, Rochelle. The differentness, the the harshness, Mm. the lovingness, the humbleness, something I also recognize in myself, the ability, there's something about um, in other parts of the world that I I really wish people would try to embody more. 
is the spirit of I literally have nothing, but do you want half? Yes. And I loved it. That's what I, I loved, found there. Yes. And these aren't superficial. There's something so stunning. Mm about making these connections and they're not superficial mm. and when you meet someone walking I, I was for example i was walking through fez and the second time i was there i'll be honest i was sick as a dog i mean i was sick right. and i was telling my assistant noful who knew how sick i was dude i'm hungry and i don't feel good yeah. and just some dude some gentleman sorry walking by says hey come to my house you guys let's get some food right now yeah. Yeah. What can I do for you? But that's the mindset. Yeah. So it's just an extreme amount of fulfillment on, on a really, really deep level. Um, and then also photographically, I just thought, let me try to, because it's hard to show something that that much mm -hmm. in just one capture. But I thought, let me see if I can do it, you know. It's interesting on your website, with, with the exception of one particular project, which we'll talk about shortly, you don't put lots and lots of words on your website. You, you let the viewer actually go in and, and, uh, and it's one of the things I said in my introduction that when, when you hear the programme back, you'll think, oh, right. Because a lot of the people I talk to explain their work in quite some detail on, on, on websites. You don't. No, I, no, I don't. Because I feel like the image, even though you do need to kind of inform mm. a little bit. And, and I know it sounds a little pedestrian to say, oh, well, we'll let the work do the talk. Yeah. Right. We'll let the work explain itself. But with my images, I like that. I like the viewer to go on their own journey mm. with it. Mm. I like them to experience their own connection and not trying to tell them what mine is. Yeah. Um, and I think with the type of work that it is, that I can let that I can let that communication happen on, on its own with the viewer, mm. just because the, the the nature of the work and the subject matter, and I want them to go on their own magic carpet ride. You yeah. know, I don't want to say hey, all aboard on the bus. No, get on. You know, do your own magic carpet ride through it. Well, it, it's I mean the intensity of, uh, of of the work is palpable in places. I mean there there is at times a very stark reality to the subject matter when you uh, revisit tougher times in your life such as, and we mentioned it before, shark skin boots, which is a reference, a nod to your late father. He was murdered when you were 10 years old. Um, it's an intense story, isn't it, that one? It is. And when I created the work, uh, what what actually spurned me to create the work was, um, and I'd have I'd had people tell me through my whole life, you know, you're so closed up. You you hold things so close to your chest. And I had come to a point in my life where I realized there was a lot of secrets. And I'd, I'd known people for 10 years and they didn't know anything about my childhood. And they didn't know anything about my father. And even my best friend one time driving through my hometown, we passed this crackhead hotel. And I spent a bit of my childhood in these places and we were driving by and I said, look right there. I used to be in that all the time as a child. And this is my best friend. It took her aback. So I realized at some point that I was operating with a lot of secrecy. Mm. And there's something about that because not only did I come to a point in my life where I realized, hey, I don't have anything to be ashamed of. As a matter of fact, it's to be celebrated yeah. because look who I am. And maybe if those things hadn't happened, I definitely wouldn't have the depth that I have now or the ability to connect with so much vulnerability. But I realized... There's no, there's no reason to have secrets in that work. Obviously, the well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying obviously, but I, I'm now guessing that the motel that you were in front of is the motel that you were telling us about. Is there a, is there a scene where you, where Dad was lost as well? That, that, that you've made a photograph of? Yes. Um, I never had any artifacts mm. of my dad's life. We mm. never had pictures. That just wasn't even a thing. Our, my, my upbringing was very violent with very few possessions. We'll put it that way. But somehow I had encountered uh, one, one paper bag. I got my hands on it. It was the evidence bag of his murder. Right. And I found his wallet yeah. in it. And I thought, wow, I'm going to go back and I'm going to photograph myself on the porch where he eventually took his last breath yeah. and i drove right to it which is so weird and i was doing these self portraits where you're running back and forth and this and that and it just didn't look right and i thought and and i always had carried his wallet with me and all of these 
shoots and his boots too. And I literally placed his wallet in the exact spot where it last rested with my dad. So I was kind of returning. For me, that was the full circle. That was the moment where I was kind of returning to the root of everything that I am, not to sound. And I thought, well, how do you do that and still make it an awesome picture? Because I'm still trying to make these pictures something to be looked at you don't want to approach something uh, especially this kind of subject matter where people can't look at it and so i thought let me do this little beautiful graphic composition so that's the one actually it's the wallet on the the wallet on the yeah incredible project a collection i knew i'd say collect we call it collections (laughs) not projects anyway (laughs) although you've used the word project so i'm not so bad yeah Um, (laughs) but i will leave a link to it i mean it's it it is incredibly strong potent work as as i said it's taken me a long long time by the way to get to a question about black and white and i've chosen to ask you about black and white when i'm just about to talk about a collection that's actually color but um but what is it about black and white the intensity the passion it is me i feel Uh, i used to shy away from oh you're too intense as that no i love the intensity the passion the way i can tell so much when i'm when i'm taking away first of all i see my work in black and white but when i'm taking away uh oh that guy's shirt is red or you know this that those are things a brain sees before it kind of sees yeah and i want to be telling all of the details that way. And it gives me such a greater power over the composition in the frame. I'm really into strong compositions, every, using whether it's using nothing in the frame or using every single micro pixel, you know? Um, and I can do that with black and white. I can do it with black and white. It's powerful, you know? So, wh- so why then is Decades of Love in Color? <laughs> <laughs> well... You know, the most incredible thing about that, and for me, that was my quest for love because I'm so romantic. And I thought, wouldn't it be beautiful to do a deep dive into love in the form of people that have been married for over 50 50 years? years, So I put these announcements out, we'll say like on on the free section of something we have called Craigslist. And and I started started trickling. So I showed it, I, I showed up at this, the first couple's house and i thought whoa their whole house is red and she's in pink and i thought isn't that amazing the way that they're matching and i go to the next house and their whole house is blue and they're in blue and i thought what (laughs) the third time it happened and it was the mint the teal mint couple and i thought this is incredible and it happened every time there's five couples i never said a word to anybody And every couple, the unification of them within their own environment, not only was their environment a color palette they had chosen for themselves, these were, I didn't run into one white wall house. No. Not only had they chosen a color palette for their life, they were literally matching it in their clothing. I know. I thought, oh man, I would be a fool. It's like the color of love. It's a wonderful project. Did you you, um, ask some questions as well? Is it, this feels to me like it, it will be a book of love. That would be the project to put their stories in. Uh, before I, especially when you, in their their old school in that era yeah. of people, yeah. it was like I needed to go into their house with nothing in my hands and just conduct at their pace a beautiful in-depth interview. You know, I was seeing these commonalities also between mm-hmm. them, which was incredible. Um, and then when I had felt and they had felt comfortable that they had revealed their whole story, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything, it was amazing. Then it was, okay, are you guys ready? Because at that point, they'd shared something so personally, so personal with me. And at that point, they're ready to yeah. expose themselves visually too. So, and then I said, hold on, I went out, got my camera. Then we did the shoot and none of this was pre-planning or anything. It was all cold walk-ups, yeah. as you would say. But boy, did I get lucky, huh? Well, I don't know. I think you make your own luck in life. And I think you attract the kind of luck, the the vibes that you put out. I really do. Um, you mentioned framing. So uh, framed in California. Love it. I love the use of the canvas backdrop. 
which far from being the frame, ju- just the frame you photograph in, it becomes the subject within the frame, if that makes sense. It's, it's very arty the way that it's used. And, and it's almost like you've, you've allowed the, it feels to me in some of the cases that you've allowed the subject to play with, with that backdrop. That, that they've almost made, you haven't positioned them, they've made that decision. Yeah, it's, it's there. It, I wanted it to be kind of like giving them an opportunity for me to photograph them in a studio and how people behave in front of a backdrop. Cause that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother vibe in a studio. And cause then they're kind of putting the show on for you, if you will. Yeah. Um, and then, so that's them. And then the rest of the frame is me. Yeah. So it's, and, and they're also lit. That's also one strobe light on them. So it's kind of elevating. Oh, and then they're also right. feeling the studio. Do you know, it's probably very obvious in the, you know, I'm going to have to have a look at this now. It's very, pro- probably very obvious that that, that's there although i didn't see it isn't that odd yeah and, and then it, it, it have some feeling even more yeah. like they're in their studio now it's their performance you know their their way of presenting themselves to me it, it's almost like you know when you put someone in front of a backdrop everything outside of the backdrop for them kind of melts away yeah if you will and then so yeah i was trying to show hey look who i'm as a photographer i wanted to also honor uh my one of my greatest heroes august sonder and because he's the master boy he's the master and i just thought wow wouldn't it be cool to tell these environmental stories there is one picture in there by the way that doesn't use your backdrop and i wondered why that was it was in the wine cellar i think it's a wine or sherry cellar or a port cellar or anyway some Mm. sort of booze going on but she didn't use your backdrop they used a, a net curtain instead well, that was one of those moments where you say, oops, I messed up big time. Where's the backdrop? And here I was hours <laughs> into wine, cu- wine country. And okay. here we are set up in this beautiful wine. And he's a flamenco guitar yeah, player. No, that's that's look at him. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. dancing for him. And I'm in this like great stone cave. And I thought, oh, cool. Yeah. So my assistant said, oh, yeah, we don't have the backdrop. And then I looked over and there's this beautiful <laughs> Spanish lace. But I got lucky again because yeah. I thought my heart when it just sinks and you thought, oh, no, dude. Uh, and then, boom, that curtain's right there. What? How how lucky could I have gotten, you know? Um, there's a very raw edge to your work. I mean, Queen's great example of that. You in, you engage very intimately with your subjects in Queen's. It's 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 almost like, you know, you're you're just you're a mate that just happens to be there with a camera. I, I try to. I try to do that. And, you know, when I'm photographing drag queens, you better believe I have my six inch heels on and my (laughs) patent leather pants, you know, (laughs) I'm in it. I'm in it with them. Right. And and that's what I try to do for all of my photo shoots. I'm in it with them. We're collaborators here and they can see it and they want to give it because I'm giving it to, you know, and they know it. People can feel it. Do you, um, I know you have a real thrill for exhibiting Times Square airports, talked about the airports in the, uh, in the, in the introduction, which you'll hear. Do you ever stand behind folk, Rochelle, and, and listen to them just to, just to, because I think I would if I was exhibiting. It's a long, 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 long time since I've exhibited, but I do remember standing behind people just to hear what they might say. <laughs> it's a nerve, it's a nerve wracking moment. And you definitely want to hear what they have to say. And I have before, and it's been quite touching. Mm. I have a picture. It's not on my website. It's 1930s wardrobe. And it's a man in a dress blues, 1930s sailor. Okay. And it's his wife who's a monk. And she's in this beautiful pale pink, uh, swirling fighting cocks, beautiful Asian dress. And they're in this passionate embrace. And this elderly veteran comes in and he's with his wife and he's tearing up because he knows what's going on and that was one of the first times that i got to experience observing someone's reaction to the work it's It's amazing i love it what kind of headspace are you in these days now uh an exciting one Mm. i this this winter so i haven't been on we'll say an expedition i was working in nepal up until may and i thought oh man i don't have anything going on Mm. can i even do it anymore you know these constant photographers helped out and i got a phone call from a local college here hey we we need you to hop in on a class can you teach i said (laughs) where do i yes how do i get there Mm. and then a couple weeks later after i was just starting to getting my feet my feet underneath me Academy Academy of Art University calls me. Uh, 
hey, we have an advanced class. Can you hop in? So almost like that, just this winter, all of a sudden I'm Professor Steele. I told everyone <laughs> I want to be called Professor Steele to the end of the semester. <laughs> but it, it, I was able to ignite myself intellectually because what I did as a knee-jerk reaction to not have worked since May, I scheduled myself a photo expedition to Peru in January. I'm going to leave in a few months. And oh. then I'm going to fly back to Nepal and then to Egypt and I'll come home for the summer and then on to Mongolia. So I'm, I'm an obsessed, I'm an obsessed photography maniac is where my headspace is. <laughs> well, um, there is a question that I ask at the end of most of my interviews. Um, and um, it's always interesting to see how it's interpreted uh, because it's a three letter question. I'm just going to say a word and I'll see where you go with it. Why? To feel, you know, and I, I, I tell this to people to answer the question, why? And then I think, why? Why do I do it? For multiple reasons. One is to feel because photography keeps me alive. Mm -hmm. And for two, to keep my fellow veterans alive too, because I want them to live. And I feel like the harder I live and the more passionate I live, I can keep them alive too. I want them to live. And the more I can do it, the more I'm like, come on guys, let's live. And I know that sounds really personal, but that's a huge reason of everything because I want them to live. And my thanks to Rachelle Steele for her time talking to me. I uh, will leave links to her work, of course, on the show page. There are some pictures there as well, which you can instantaneously uh, see when you go to the show page. But do follow the links uh, or the link because uh, her work is just, oh, it's wonderful. I love this idea of collections as well. I really do. And that's it for today. But if you can't wait until next Friday and you'd like to walk a bit further together, then there is the Extra Mile edition. We're up to number 67. It's waiting for you. The Extra Mile is uh, part of our private Patreon channel where our wonderful, wonderful community of supporters and walkers and photographers, adventurers, who want to help keep this podcast alive and stay here week after week, make a modest and generous monthly or annual contribution. Or you could buy my book. Did I mention the book? This week on the show, AI, how our brains interpret images. I'm getting a nosebleed already. <laughs> um, a flugelhorn playing photographer who just happens to be a celebrated professor of physics. I am going to be hiding behind the sofa and gently swaying with imposter syndrome uh, because this person has actually cleared a space in the diary to talk to us. Uh, also, Valerie Jardin returns. She's been chasing priests and nuns around with a camera. <laughs> See? Something for everyone. On this week's Extra Mile. On the art side, I also am pretty... I, mean, I, I feel like whenever technology comes out, there's a, there's a group of the part of the art world who complains that it's the end of art as we know it. And then there's a group of artists who embrace, you know, the camera, for example, yeah. <laughs> as the end of painting or something and drawing. And, oh, yeah. and, you know, it ends up changing the world if you do it right. And so... You know, I, I'm sure that AI is going to join the world of artistic expression in in the same way that all technologies have. People actually see me, and I'm I'm never sneaky. No. I uh, never. I mean, I'm 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 invisible, but I'm not sneaky. That's very I different. Like that. I try not to. Uh, I, I I grab shots without people seeing me because I do not want to change whatever caught my attention in the first place. Yes. If they stop doing what they're doing and they see me, then the moment is gone. Our PS to the show is to come, our postscript for this week. But before that, we need a playout song just to make some final frames to or think about what's being said today. And, um, well, it's interesting, before I say who it's from, tell you about it. It's interesting, the show survey, what's been said about the, the playout song. Most, most, most want to keep it and those who don't say they free will through it anyway so early news i think it will stay but um one comment <laughs> hit hard which said they're all a bit depressing neil um music is very personal in terms of it's very subjective in terms of how you receive it and what i think is either romantic or dreamy or wistful 
to somebody else might be depressing. Um, it's such a subjective thing, isn't it? Anyway, this one is far from depressing. I would call this one my camera bag packing song. It's, it's on my, and it really is, by the way, I keep a playlist of songs for my ears when I go to places like London or when I'm travelling, because it's nice to hear the, the kind of music that I'm planning to use on the programme. And this is, uh, this is one that sets me up for hustle-bustle photography. It's up, it's bright, it's jazzy, it's certainly multi-layered. It's Anthony Lazaro and yada yada ya. It's time to go now, bit farewell and goodbye I live in everything like the catcher in the ride I feel I'm on a road, stop standing in my way All our little mind games won't talk me into staying on Living with a bull, with a random flight The only thing I know, it's gonna be tonight I can't picture you, oh, poor forsaken thing Written up this ladder while I've been taking wind, oh yeah sing with the songs nil you'll ruin them uh, Anthony Lazaro who sounds like he means business there doesn't he yada business I always liked um, for those that know this name you'll instantly know what I'm talking about for those that uh, are not so aware of him because you live in another country John Peel he was uh, sadly he's uh, the late John Peel now but uh, he was a fantastic broadcaster on the national BBC pop channel radio one i was very lucky for a short while to have well to consider him a colleague a peer um and a mentor actually it was uh, it was fantastic to to know john and uh he's his music was certainly eclectic uh, on his late night shows in particular it would go from thrash uh, death metal through to well sometimes folk country something um 
well, sometimes operatic. I mean, it was, that's what made the, I can't say at the time, I necessarily appreciated it as much as I would now. I used to love listening to John because of his presentation style. And uh, maybe I should look some, something up. It might be some YouTube material somewhere that features him as a broadcaster. But uh, now, oh, do you know what? If I could listen to a John Peel show every night, I'd be absolutely made up. I really would. Um, it's the eclectic, very subjective uh, nature of, of music. Right. Final sketchbook to show where we've walked today. There's a lone tree over there. In fact, there's a... In, f- in fact, closer. There's... Um, I'm not sure. It's not got enough berries on it. What are these berries, then? They are... They look like danger do not eat berries, but they're right next to the hawthorns. This yellow... It is hawthorns, isn't it? This yellow spread. Oh, I do hope I've got that right. Let's get a picture. One, two, fifth, F4. ISO 200. It's incredible how this land in a reasonably short amount of time, uh, is being, is being um, gathered back, claimed back, reclaimed by nature. And where I'm walking now, this would have been, they dug out, I know I've told this story before, but bear with me. I don't think my other listener was listening that day. They dug out the concrete of the, this huge, long runway, and they used it as the base layer, I know that's not the official phrase, but the base, as it were, for um, a huge bypass that goes around the the town of Newbury, next door here. And uh, I'm now on that runway, what would have been the runway. Incredible, huge. (laughs) Ah, just a few closing thoughts before my PS. My sincere thanks to you if you are or you're about to become an extra miler over this holiday period. My promise to you is to keep building this community of kindness. A safe place to share our photography and our thoughts. If you can share the show uh, either through the handy buttons on the show page or the old-fashioned way of saying to a friend, oi! Uh, in a group perhaps. You can still oi in a group. A Facebook group. Oi! I've been listening to this podcast. It's really very different. Letters, guests, comments, all sorts of stuff. Then that would be fantastic. Send them the photowalk.show website. Pop it up there on your Facebook page. Wonderful. Thank you. And that would be great support. Or you could buy the book. Did I mention the book? Not quite sure I mentioned the book. That's a great way to support the show as well as we we move forward through 2024. My thanks very much wholeheartedly to uh, to Neil Ford who looks after IT Andrea Gilpin who's across Instagram Kelly Mitchell and Emily Ranier who look after our Facebook members uh, we need a postscript for the show a PS I'd like to introduce into your life I know some of you will know her already in fact probably a great many of you but uh, Imogen Cunningham Uh, For my other listener who's not quite so aware of her, Imogen Cunningham was an American photographer born in 1883, passed on in 1976. She was known for her botanical photography, for nudes and industrial landscapes. She was a member of the California-based group F64, known for its dedication to the sharp, focused rendition of simple subjects. I'd say at that value, that's pretty sharp. Uh, She was for a time considered one of the greatest photographers alongside Ansel Adams. Uh, And during the 1960s and 1970s, at the height of the women's liberation movement, many recognised Imogen for her important contributions, blazing a trail for women who wanted to take up photography. Now, my other listener is furiously tapping Imogen's name into Google. Uh, So... Don't worry, dear other listener. I shall leave some handy links on the show page. And so the, the PS I've chosen, this gem uh, for you, is, uh, is from Imogen. And it closes off today's uh, show. We're back for next week's um, one just before Crimble's. The PS, in that she passed away pretty much three decades before the invention of podcasting, and when I was still in short trousers with a full head of golden locks, I didn't get a chance to ask her the following question. Um, which of your pictures is your favourite? <laughs> Not that I would have asked anything quite so cliché 
Uh, but had I asked her, she would no doubt have thrown this gem back at me, which is today's PS. Which of my photographs is my favourite? I think the one I'm going to take tomorrow. Come on, pups. Let's head home. Oh, it's starting to rain. Do you want a, do you want a treat? Treat? Come on, then. Shouldn't have too many of these. We've got turkey dinners to come, you know. Yeah. I'll feed you, don't worry. I know I'm not supposed to feed you from the table. Our secret's safe. The Photo Walk is a Loading Zone production.